Keep the doorways clear. Let's roll, please. Roll away. Roll away. Ready? And fire. Fire coming up. And backwards. Speak. Action. 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 Oh, Ready up. Round the other side. Round the other side. interesting director. He's one of the few directors that doesn't look at drawings. He just says, whatever you build, you know, I'll just shoot. I'll come in like a documentary crew. I'll shoot it. I mean, he doesn't really understand just shooting a bit of a set or a wall or one direction. And he changes his direction as the sun changes, always keeping everything backlit. So I needed to create an environment where he could move around me and work in a style that he likes to work. Okay, show me. Oh, I yes. Put the pipe out of the way. Good job. Stuff flying around in there. Ready? Yeah. Four. Four? You get completely inside the window. Uh, yes. See, you don't want to use this monitor? You, you uh, check me, no? Here. I yeah, got you. I got you. I got you. Collapse this with me, no. So you want to roll? Dude, the structure, if you can get any lower and up. Okay. And oh, yeah, and then pan up to the chimney. Roll it. Speed. In their writings, they said they put up this fort, which encompassed almost an acre of land, in 30 days. And to do that, they had to cut posts that were 12 to 15 feet high out of the ground. So they had to dig, uh, you know, 1,200 feet of trenches to put the posts in. And then they had to they had to strip the posts of all their leaves, uh, branches, and then put them upright. And it it, it just had to be a superhuman task. We built the fort out of local materials so that the clay and the wall and daub looked right. A lot of it because I wanted to see how, how it would work. Um, there's no hinges on it. How are they? Uh, they, they got wood, wooden pins carved at the top and the bottom. And we mortised wow. out a, uh, you know, a little hole at the top and then dropped that down on it. And they actually work really well. And they, you know, it's like, they didn't need anything. Heavy. It's great. 800 pounds each. <laughs> We're building everything real so that Terry has the freedom to shoot anywhere, inside a building, outside a building. If the building gets knocked down, it'll look real. You don't see two by fours or one by threes or anything. I think it was tough for people at the beginning. I mean, I think their instinct is to want to go to exactly the way they know how to build things. And Jack, Jack didn't let up. <laughs> and I think. Um, it, that was tough in the beginning for people, but I think as it went up, they all saw what it was you were actually getting. Well, the first thing I'm, I'm looking at are the condition of the fields around Fort where after trees are cleared, this is what you would have, of course, that, that kind of wooded weeds coming up. I never really thought about the entire environment. That's when one opportunity we got here. And then to look at the shape of the fort and the cannon in place, there's two things that are missing in Jamestown. The initial discussions I had with Jack Fisk was to give him a description of as, as much of what we have found of the, of the real James Fort and its architectural pattern and type of materials that may have been used to build the, the walls and, and also the buildings, the things that he would need to create a set. Terry likes things real and it was much more fun to build this real. And I, I think we've kept the archaeologists more interested because they've They've got to see buildings that they imagined, you know, built three-dimensionally. Ah, it smells good. <laughs> so we got a little loft up here, and uh, we built most all the furniture. It's so neat, you know, to see 
see it. I wish. It's true. Yeah, I wish we could yeah, transplant it over. Because <laughs> it's very, it, you know, that's one of our very difficult thing about archaeology is that you know, we know what we're seeing from these patches of dirt in the ground, you know, the colored dirt, but it's really hard to explain to the visitor, you know, what that represents. Um, it's hard to imagine unless you have something like this that you can walk through. What this captured is is the is the essence of what it was like to be in James Port. In my own mind's eye, I would I would this captures that feeling completely. Uh, that it, it was crowded. Uh, there was a lot of activity going on. Just as it's going on now, it's building and, and even though it's you know modern construction, it, I mean modern uh, contractors. It, it would. This is this is really what it would be like. We probably have a hundred people in here. That's about the you know about how many people were, uh, actually were in the fort and, and building everything. So it's a time capsule. Yeah. It did take a big dive down there, didn't it? What's the tip? It'll be all right. I can pull it out. My information is the Indians mostly came from the Jamestown narrative, and it was uh, Thomas Spillman, I believe, that spent several years living with the Indians, and he wrote about his life there. And then some of it is from uh, records of excavations that they've had in the area. They've been able to find holes in the ground that showed an outline of the houses. It's different from what we saw recorded by John White in North Carolina, and we used that to uh, fashion our main villages. Unlike the white drawings, which are shown as flat-ended buildings, they actually are finding they were, they were all round shape, which we have done, because they actually stand up better than the, than the flat-ended ones. We're stripping down these logs using these draw knives, uh, taking the bark off them to make the uprights that will become uh, Powhatan's uh, house, as far as I know. Basically, what we're having to do is this area up here, you can see where my hand is, where the poles are attached to the top of the hut, this is basically now the ground. Whereas you can see how we put, how we put the poles in the ground on the other huts. Well, what we're in fact doing is building a hut now up on top of this structure. Buck, this wall from here to here props up and there's gonna be uh, covered is areas out there. It's gonna be like a courtyard. Solution for your like rotunda kind of. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, it'd be light, but then we can close it and it'll be dark and how it's gonna be back in this area like where the scaffolding is. The idea is that there'll be a door probably somewhere around here. Oh, so you come through down here. Yeah. You know the English, they talk about all the windings. All the windings. Yeah. They yeah. have to go all the way around. Just trying to get an idea of how your windings go. <laughs> you come around there, and you come in, and he's, he's way at the other end. We were extremely lucky in that um, we, we chose to build things as closely to the way that they think they were built, I mean, as, as best we can tell. Doing it this way and using all natural things that we had, we not only kept the cost down, but I also think that we got to the desired result much quicker than had we gone a traditional route. We had tried to build these things like scenery and then disguise them. Did that one not get tied up? No, they're all. So I need to bunch they're them in. They're all in. You need to take over here. Wait a minute. Stakes. Let me just bunch them in tighter. I hate to do that, but it'll be fine. We spent some time researching and finding seeds for Indian corn because corn now is hybrid and, and Indian tobacco and uh, you know other melons and things that they would grow. And we were able to obtain some of those seeds and, and plant our fields. We planted about a three acre field for the main garden at Were Wokomoko. We're weeding as much as possible, but trying to do it thinking that it would be like the Indians would do it. You would do the bare minimum to, as much as you could to have your crop come up without, you know, these guys are, it was pre-iron tools at this point. So they're out here with, you know, I don't know what they use, sticks, bone scrapers. So you're not gonna get everything out of here. We invited the chiefs and assistant chiefs and representatives of all the native tribes in Virginia to come and see what we were doing and participate as much as they liked. And um, we had wonderful, wonderful participation from several of them. In April of 2004, late April, mid-April to, to early May, uh, I became aware uh, that, that there would be a film production company in Virginia and they would be filming a, a production-length movie called The New World. 
my initial reaction to the term new world was, was one of, hey, what's new about it? We've been here 15,000 years. And, and it really rubbed me wrong that the title for this movie would be New World. So it started out on the wrong foot. I did, in fact, talk with, uh, with Terry Malick. And he said, I think you'll be pleased with the twist that we put on the title, New World. As the story has developed from something out of history and something that's been told over and over again and, and told incorrectly in some people's eyes, the most important thing that came out of this is how important it is to bring the body language of, of Indian people into this to speak a language of, of memory and of uh, just remembering that we can tell the story our own way through our bodies. And so in these next two weeks, which is really not a long time, we've got to be able to get you guys all to become 17th century human beings. I want you to really take big steps out. So see how my knee is straight up above my heel? That's, that's ideal. And then that transfer happens, right? Yeah? And your, your foot's aiming forward. All the weight is all in the hamstrings and your butt. So just make a sort of, just go around this net just that far. You're going to feel it, trust me. Who's fine phone is We created a core group of warriors for the movie that we called from all over the country. Just people who had a, a physicality and a spirit and a look that, that we felt would work together. And they became a tribe. They're, these are people from different tribes all over the all over the country and Canada and wherever. And they um, they became a tribe of their own for this movie. And it was a very profound thing to watch. What Terry wants to see more than anything else is that as we see everybody in the canoes, walking through the woods, whatever else, what separates you guys from the English is that you people are in complete harmony with the earth and the universe and everything that exists. I've been working with the guys to get to the core of their, their instinctive knowledge about bringing in you know, a totemic animal into the way they move, into the sounds that they make. Go for it. Just, yeah, yeah. Everybody try that one? Look that way. Kiss your hand. <laughs> nice one, eh? We're gonna work on these ones today. Right. And try to get them in the, the whole that whole attitude of prayer that he wants. When he's yeah. always gonna zero in on people. I just kinda wanna to, to, from what he said a lot is also to lose that kind of twentieth century posture that, Yeah, yeah, I know. Right, exactly. That kind of look yeah. that yeah. kind of yeah. mod, but, but but not not to get it to the point where it's the noble savage kind no, of No, I know, you know, I know. You know, but, but, but like but, today, but just kind of a very in tune with with the sure. body and just kind of has that presence of like, yeah. you know, we're ready, we know ourselves. Right. Yeah. We had to do intensive series of exercises, number one, just for cardio and muscle building, because the way people looked when they were um, living off the land has a very different physical stance. Come on, you give it up, man. You're not trying to pick up Miss America here, come on. having us do all these crazy things like take a tennis ball, go through our legs, walk toe to heel, and you don't really know how effective that's going to be till you actually come out here and you're actually in the woods walking like that and you see all that balance where it all comes into play. And um, it's him warming us up spiritually and everything, getting in tune with everyone that was here at these land, in this land 400 years ago. Some of the activities that you guys might be taking place in may be background things that we need to have happening. But still at the same time, we want to have that care in what your presentation is. We want to have that care in your presence and what you guys are bringing to the set and what you guys are bringing to almost like our persona because we are going back 400 and some odd years. We're going to put Artie in the back of the boat first, okay. put you in the front, and we're going to perfect just a few strokes. We're not going to do tonnage of strokes. These guys have learned three, four strokes. 
when you're pulling in, you slice back out with it. Maybe I don't want to make it like this way. Exactly, you got it. And um, that's the draw stroke. That makes you go that direction. So not like in in a, in a single canoe where you go to go that way. And you, right. You don't do that shit. Not well. He does it in the back. But you don't do it in the front. The thing you do in the front is either the draw to make it go that way, or to there go the go. opposite way. It's called a pry, and you're right. going to use the edge of the boat. And you do like that. Okay. Because see, once we get okay, into well, these picture boats, that. that's a motherfucker. That one. Isn't it, it is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Shit, man, he's got an inch to play with there. This extras training camp was a major push because it was so crucial to the film, Terry. Obviously, and all of us wanted everybody to look look the part, look like they had been doing this for years, look like it was 1607, you know, and not 2004. No, I was in one of the fucking wide things while I was, it was like a kayak, huh? you know, we were even doing this, you couldn't go over them. But I'll be in the dugout, I think, tomorrow, and that's the end of me. Oh, oh, you put sets in there, huh? I gotta plug my fucking knob just in case that flies into it, because that water looks like it's fucking manky. <laughs> Don't fancy having a urethra. It's going to be particularly difficult out here because it's going to be hot, it's going to be nasty, you're going to be covered with mud. It's not going to be pleasant. The working conditions are not going to be pleasant. You're going to be working real hard. And the temperature is going to be way up there. Open your pan, crossed here. Don't rest it on your hip. That aims it into your face. Okay? Grip it right about here with this hand. Now you'll see you can balance it right there. Open the pan, fill the pan half full. When the pan is half full, you will close the pan. You'll bring the musket up to your face and blow the excess powder off the top of the pan cover. Slowly squeeze the trigger. Don't jerk it back. You will not squeeze the trigger and I like to tell you to. Oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to squeeze the trigger. <laughs> I'm used to it. Once we selected our core colonists, then we brought them in for the training camp as well, and they learned, uh, you know, musketry, and they learned how to fire, they learned swordsmanship. Unfortunately, accidents happen, as they often do. Do you want to stick these under cover? But I think they got the people to have a really good, uh, really good production. So this time, I want you to connect this, the, the, the frog, watch like this. Frog. Okay, so stay low, frog, from right there. Yeah, nice. Now do do a frog, back bend, back to a frog. So it's gonna here. One of the great challenges of this movie was finding an actress to play Pocahontas. We looked all over the world for her. It was about an eight-month search, and in the last month. Renee happened to be casting for another project, which was calling for a very different sort of character. And Corianka Kilcher, who had been in Los Angeles all this time, was submitted for that movie. We happened to be doing a camera test, and so we said, oh, come stand in front of this 35 millimeter camera with no makeup and just yourself and see what happens. And I tell you, when we, when we screened that footage, it, she just jumped off the screen at us. She has something really extraordinary. It's powerful and it's beautiful. And it's just, it's Pocahontas. It's who we saw as this character who would mesmerize John Smith and be strong enough to sway him from one course and lead him into another for periods of time. You have a journey from very beginning to, you know, your yeah. death. It's just, and it's not even the loss of innocence because see, already that's a very negative term. We don't lose innocence. You wouldn't have any concept of what losing innocence is. It's life is a journey. And like it, it, you know, your last little speech to John over at the end, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a time and it's passing and now it's death, it's next time. So you have to embody just every bit of that philosophy in every single thing you do. But from the beginning to the end of the film, that is your physical journey. With Koryanka, we're trying to find a way to segue her into the world of English speaking so from that, starting from a place of gesture and body language and her own native language of Algonquin, she has to find a way to move into it slowly so it will be through the body first. As she was starting to learn the words in the um, Palatan language, we started to um, find gestures that would speak of those things. And sometimes they're very specific, very um, sort of like 
a pictograph. They, they tell a real specific story. And sometimes it's just the way we talk with our hands to get her um, to feel comfortable expressing with her hands and in a way that we believe is more appropriate to that time period. Bocateo, bocateo. It's completely unusual that um, oh, just a language that ceased to be spoken is going to be revived for the purposes of the film in order to bring the authenticity of having the people speak the language that was really being spoken here. Adequate. Sky. Sky. A little bit more of the... Sky. Yeah. I'm not sure. <clears throat> Sky. Sky. Yeah, so that it sounds more like a G. That's good. Lovely. Gisos. And the same with the K on that. Gisos. 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 Son. Son. Bocatea. Fire. 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 The film is making um, a great deal of effort to, to be as authentic as possible in terms of representing the native people of, of um, historic Virginia. It's not generic Indian. It's actually going to be Virginia Algonquin, as Virginia Algonquins were back then. We did a certain amount of research into the, the look of the, the Algonquin particularly, really to, to arrive at a, an identification of this particular tribe plus giving them, all the, each individual braves, their own individual look. Think about as many people as you guys can handle per day that we can see at 1.30 when we have that show and tell for Terry. Um, whether it's really three as your max or whether you can do more, because I want to take this week to figure out what all the options are, like what, what's the best texture of mud, all the different ways you can do the mud, what's the best texture of ash, is it better on bare skin or is it better on you know, um, um, paint, like, well, the ash, what if you sprinkle ash over a fresh paint? Yeah. You know, all those kinds of things. I know Terry's really, really interested in seeing texture and layers. You know, we have things that we can get that, that do the same thing, that look the same, just once you start smearing it all over it. Right. But ash will be, it will have a, a, a kind of a thick and dark, you know, thick and light areas. It'll, it'll move around. Which I think Rather is like good short. as long as our base coat is strong enough. That's, yeah, that's, that's the key. Uh, yeah. Because, uh, uh, the, the actual materials themselves aren't necessarily the best for things to use. I like see. for instance, the mud that we just, we just put regular mud on the guy, it needs a bonder, something that'll have longevity and it'll stay. Uh, it's it's chalky. Is it, it's this is it. kind of chalky. Yeah. This kind of freshens it up where it just More looks like fresh. A and it's got a little bit of a glisten and it doesn't look quite as chalky. We had a lot of experimentation to do because it was worth just figuring out. Even the most ridiculous patterns we'd try out, we'd try out any kind of, um, any kind of texturing. You know, we looked in you know, all the, the, the possibilities of, um, you know, the, the various earths around at the time. I think this is exactly the right color, just a little redder. I think that's good. But, uh, you know, Terry and the thick, yeah. you know, yeah. thickness of it. I think that, well, the question is what about the space, how to bring it up to that color, because that is a different red here. That's what that's what you did, right? Or is that did you put red on your face as well? This new red? No, I didn't. No, okay. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, okay. We're we'll, almost there. We'll wash you off and, and start again with a different color red. Even if it, I think it may be even if it's just a, a kind of um, a rub off the, the texture stuff. Okay. And go it again. But I think yeah, that's. But I think we're there in this guy. Oh, this is going to be shagged. Oh, there's not going to be like an extension right now? Oh, this is going to have, you're going to have more hair here. But we love all your wild stuff. Love all the wild. The 
Powhatan Indians of that day shaved one half their head right down the middle and would take off the whole side of it. Besides being a style that you know, became just part of their tribal look, it had a very, very practical application. So I, being right-handed, would shave the right-hand side of my head so that when I shot my bow and arrow, it wouldn't ever interfere with my long hair. I had a hair issue, and I didn't, I didn't, want, I didn't want to cut my hair because uh, from my tribe and our beliefs, you know, we only cut our hair when someone close to us dies. And I kind of had to do some soul searching about it, but I had to realize who I was representing here, and it does the Algonquin people and the Pamukkis, it does them justice, you know, for, for me to have to have cut my hair this way, and it's kind of like a tribute to them, you know, 500 years later, 400 years later. Okay, step forward again. We're doing the reverse you. of your close-up. Right. So if you stand up right there, the okay. ships will be coming towards you, and okay. Jimmy will perform an acrobatic okay. move to save the shot. At first I had to really come up with a look for these Indians, which I did base loosely on the white drawings, which I think were so classical in their rendering that I felt, though these Indians were quite refined and had wonderful, you know, techniques that they'd honed over the centuries, that they weren't, wouldn't be as rigid, they'd be much more organic and more natural. Mainly what we did is tried to use the skin in the most natural way possible without using a lot of fringe because they knew that we were going to be a bit fringe pho phobic. And so we tried to use, actually use the, use the holes for her. Yeah, that yeah that's great. In, in a that. nice way. Um, yeah, this, you know, this is like the feathers, the, you know, her mm -hmm. pearls. Mm -hmm. um, then do breech cloths for her where we actually sewed some shells and things into, into the, the holes. holes. Yeah. We used 30,000 marginella shells on Powhatan's cape and did it just the way they would have done it then. We tried to be respectful of not only their process but their respect for animals and nature and that all of their costumes were tributes to animals. I, I was very honored in June to be invited to a meeting with the production staff uh, and other chiefs in, in Virginia to meet with the production staff to simply review what the movie was going to be about and how it was going to be presented. And, and during our discussions, they expressed some concern to me that they were having difficulty finding wild turkey feathers and deer antlers for the purposes of costume construction. Um, fortunately for me, I have a lot of friends that are very good hunters, and at that time I had oh, about 12 boxes of wild turkey feathers and 60 to 70 sets of antlers in my shed. Uh, Jackie so impressed me with the research and the honesty that she was attempting to portray our people that I offered to give them to her uh, so that the costumes could be as authentic as possible uh, to ensure that our people would be accurately represented. Now, Smith had, had fought in the wars in Turkey, Turkey and, and, and stuff, so one of the researches is, you know, that he used the falchion a lot, which is the, 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 the thicker. Yeah, I love that blade. And Terry had talked about possibly, instead of you carrying this the whole time, of coming out at the battle, you know, when they the Indians are in the field, yeah. that you just, you know, you're you're going to war, and this is the weapon you have. This is just a prototype. The, the finished one's not done yet is a port alone, which is, is going to be your own little notebook where you, you store your papers in here in the folded section over here. And then this will be, sketches yeah, this is a little pencil here that's actually just graphite. And that's how they did it. They would wrap them in string like that. We're just on the cusp of the Industrial Revolution here, so things were, were very much, uh, you know, all furniture and that were individually made and handmade with certain tools, but I mean, we, we, we were not yet into industrial age. It's just a, a shoe for a wooden shovel, a metal shoe for a wooden shovel, and I'm gonna put some copper rivets to hold it on. It's got a sharp edge. They mainly just shovel in sand, but, but uh, when it wears out, they just can just replace the, uh, the metal. They found bits of this in the well at Jamestown. Not bits, but the whole shoe. Can we actually 
cover this with a piece of leather you yeah know, all the way over yeah, now see it's good because i can stitch to either side of it now that i have this to go to okay of, you know? Uh, that, I, was, I was also thinking of maybe a, a solid band over there. I can do that too, because now and then I can these just poke along. through the band, see? Okay. The items so for the native cultures and that, uh, we literally made each one. All the bows are made, all the quivers are made, all the arrows are a whole handmade. There's nothing um, in, the, in the native culture that we can really, you know, buy off the shelf. Started out just with a piece of split bone split it down the middle, they just break it and make it split, and then sharpen the edges, make a knife out of it. Be a tool, I'll just show you right over here. From this to that, obviously it works. If it'll stick through that piece of cardboard, it'll darn sure stick through you. You know, so much was lost of that culture. You have to kind of fill in a lot of blanks. But then the blanks are not that big, actually, because, because you, you have the elements, you, you know, what did they have? They had leather, they had feathers, they had uh, stone, and they had wood, you know? And so you work with those materials and they, and, and they demand their own realization. <laughs> One of the biggest draws to Virginia was having these three replica ships literally five miles from our major set location. They were the, the three ships, the Susan Constant, the Godsby, and the Discovery. And they're part of a museum called the Jamestown Settlement, which is run by the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. The ships are all anchored at Jamestown, uh, or tied up at the pier at Jamestown, for um, the vi all the visitors and tourists kind of things. We're all volunteers. All of us come in, some people from far away. Uh, Doug comes all the way from North Carolina and other folks even uh, even further to, to volunteer on these ships, really to, to help just maintain. help maintain them. Uh, this is the glamorous part, uh, believe it or not. In the wintertime, there's painting, scraping, uh, a lot of cleaning up. So it's not all uh, it's not all movies. I really don't want much contrast. So if it's in like if you squint or do a black and white picture, I like them to look. So I look like one color. To disappear. Um, I want I want this line to disappear. So you don't really. So this is the same value as this. But just color. Okay. So it's pretty dark. Yeah. The ships, as they sit in uh, Jamestown, are very brightly colored. There's a lot of white on them, and. They didn't look used, so we put some effort into uh, aging them down and making them look uh, more to what I thought ships of the period would look like. Uh, I have to ask you a big favor to um, to check, be responsible in your own boat, uh, to be sure that there's nothing like a water bottle, in, because I have a crane and we might go up and down and start shooting. It's very hard to see in the monitor. Okay. The image is this small, so I cannot see water bottles and things like that, and then they appear on base. The scene today is the, the first arrival. Uh, we'll be taking some of the, uh, the colonists from the Godspeed, rowing ashore, and uh, I believe Newport is going to have the first words uh, to announce our new arrival in the new world. So it should be a good day. Looking forward to it. As soon as I feel you want to go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, all right. And it's better if I come down on this shelf. The first day we did uh, an enormous amount of work. We were literally just thrown in. It's a pretty quick moving um, vehicle, you know, largely, this shoot. Uh, which isn't what I expected. 11, Charlie, take one. B mark. Stand by. And back round. Action. Oh, okay, go. 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 Move it. Move that. Go. 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 Yeah. Get down to us. Stop 
open. Shooting all the ships together and the support that, that we needed, the support boats needed to shoot the, the vessels, proved to be one of the biggest challenges on the movie. Can you get one or two shots off safely? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Just go in front of yeah, the camera again. Yeah, I got a can get this out. Do me a favor, go in front of the camera and stay there as the, as the boats go. Hey! Yeah, okay. Need to come in more. Hold on, guys. Hold the we got shot. Waves. Hold the shot. Coming. This is good. This is good. Waves coming. This is good. Hold the shot. Try. Guys, disappear. Go backwards. Go backwards. Corey, clear the frame. Clear out of the shot. Closer to the camera. Closer to the camera. Come back this way, guys. Look to the camera. Stay here. Come, come in front. Cut. Let's cut. Go closer to camera. Yeah. We had the boat sailing on the James River, we had it sailing on the Chickahominy River, and sailing and rowing on eight, eight of the, the creeks off of the James and Chickahominy. Naturally, this gets everybody right in the mood, because along the way we're handling sail and working in conditions that, that would have been faced by the very same people that arrived on these vessels in 1607, right here in Jamestown. It makes, for us, it gives us a real life experience of what these original settlers would have experienced. Can I ask you a favor? Yes. Could you hide behind this as much as you can behind this uh, tree? Yes. And maybe get very low? Yes. No, no, hide this way. You don't want the English to see you. Oh, this way? Yeah. Okay. Let's go closer to that. Go clo get closer, get closer. Somewhere in there. And I'll get, get very, get small, forget about this thing. Yeah, like that, like that. That's very cool, okay. Uh, Zimmerman, pass me the camera. Getting three ships in a narrow river, river like positioned that? properly the, uh, and get all the support ships out of the way really proved to be a challenge. Can they move that boat away? Uh, I will check. They're no, positioning for the shot up top. Yeah. Why is that, that little boat has to be there? The tiny fucking boat. Okay. If it's not working, they should be out because second unit can be shooting here a masterpiece, but you're not allowing it. Yeah, we're already shooting. I will work on it. Okay, roll. Get the boat out of position. 11 and a half. You guys can in sooner. Roll. And camera. Go, guys. That's beautiful. That's it. Disappear, guys. Okay, let's do one with l less chaotic. A little more nicer move. A ballet. Smooth. Jimmy, let's go again through this. I thought that had moments of ecstasy. Yeah, but more less ecstasy, more, more exquisite. <laughs> <laughs> go through these trees, don't fan that way. Okay, okay fine. Okay, okay roll it. Rolling. Rolling now. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. And action. Closer to the camera, somebody, guys. Can you come in? Disappear. Let's do it again, let's do it again, let's do it again. So this is the moment, this is the moment. Back up. Okay. Z axis, Jimmy. Don't, don't do the German thing. Let's go. <laughs> yes. And roll it. Boy, you are. Now you are. Yeah. Yeah. Roll it. Um, yes. Action. Like that? Nobody's safe. No work. We're too kind. Go. Cross the tree. Disappear. There, guys. That was the best. <laughs> okay, let's do one more. You have to be lower. That's the trick. The conditions here in Virginia have been some of the toughest I've worked on. It was tough to keep the equipment dry, free from humidity, the lenses from fogging up, the cameras running. Guys on the Godspeed, there you are. 
Thank you. You'll be moving around during the shot. Gentlemen, the yellow rain go up, disappear. Thank you. The rain would come and hit us in an instant. The environment, the conditions, the heat, humidity, and moisture were all a real challenge for us in the camera park. Oh, you are going to help us. Oh, yeah. boy. <laughs> we're going to go do that and then we go for the swim as well. We're going to go the same as golf as well. Oh, fucking good. Get in the water, man. I'd spread the tent out so you got the right size, get underneath it with the poles lifted up, and then start pulling out the side yeah. while somebody holds the poles up. Yeah. I think we got the most rainfall in our six month period in in Virginia history. I mean, it was astonishing the amount of rain that we got. We had uh, one guy on the crew got real sick and I think it might have been a spider. Really? Uh -huh. Can I tell you something? It's the, what's the name of the ones that- uh, Black Widow? No, no, no. The ones that have the big brown belly. Um, There's a brown recluse. They don't yes. Have, they don't have brown recluse in Virginia. They don't? No, yeah, they do. They say they do, but they don't. We just saw one. Well, Mr. a Fisk. visiting from somewhere else. <laughs> so, oh, it, it came in the, in the camera. In the camera. <laughs> yeah. in the camera. <laughs> you come back and then you swing with cucking, remember? And then you hit his hand. Right. You hit his hand and then remember you went away? Right. So now you do this. We'll do, we're going to do all that right here? Yeah. Okay. Is it, yeah. All right. Good? Yeah. Open. So wait for. Yeah, and then, and then we cut. We cut. Okay, I'll start from right here. So it'd probably be a good idea if he. If he stops here, because no, there's a platform. No, stop right here. Might. This is the map. He will be right here. Stop. If you float it off. Right yeah. We're working on the. John Smith will come in to uh, try to go to find an uh, Indian the camp, the, uh, the village for Indian. And uh, this is the second fight scene, and he got captured by the Indian. I have like nine inches on this side. So you can lift the deck or pull. We build up the platform under the water, because the water, at the daytime, maybe on your knee, maybe nighttime, is already over your head. So we need to build, build two platforms to try to fit the water level. We've been in the walkway right now, you see, you know, the ladder over there. Is the, you know, we're trying to make, you know, the level of, you know, the water and the soil, you know, and we, so that people can really run over and then we really can fight on top of the water. But look like we're on, on top of the, you know, the, the whole bar. Yeah. Which is good. Like... Ooh, hoo, hoo. Yeah. Yeah. The smell in this area is pronounced. No, it's nothing like where I was earlier today over there. The scenes, I mean, Colin the first time fight with the Indians, so very interesting. And they, they come out just like ghosts, you know, they're running fast, they jump out from the tree. Basically, it's a real, like, uh, dark, uh, eerie uh, atmosphere that we get to come out of and portray, you know, warriors, you know, attacking John Smith. You know, I think just from watching, everybody's really learning fast and putting everything they can into it, you know, 110%, and that's what it takes. As far as the, the warriors, the Algonquin, Powhatan warriors, you know, that's how we want to, we want people to see, you know, when they watch this film, that man, these guys, they went all out, you know, they, they brought it, you know, to this movie. You know, they just came with everything that they had. See, Mark. And At the time of the English arrival, most of our people were farmers and fishermen because we did live on the, the river and we did farm the land. John Smith 
when he arrived in 1608 said, we had a thousand acres of corn growing on the land adjacent to the Potomac. Can we pull back to her face after I do this? Eleven, Harry. Okay. <coughs> Eleven. Rolling. Rolling. Some speed. Some speed. And any time, action. Rolling. Bring it down. Down, down, down. There, and open it up. Towards the camera. Feature it towards the camera a little. A little bit more moving, Carolina, right where you are. Little, That's other, it. Other hand as well. I think, what was I doing when I was 14, man? Great. You know, so guys would be mates now. would stay over. Barry McGuire, I remember, would stay over. I was playing a lot of football. I mean, it was pretty much the staple of my diet. And here at 14, Corey Anchor Kilcher has to come on and play, and is fortunate too, and is happy that she is. But she has to, every day, perform as Pocahontas. Go for that. She's doing incredible. She's amazing. She's such an insane mix of lightness and darkness of spirit. But she has a smile that could light up both hemispheres at the same time. And she has just a depth of darkness which would make the world stand still and stop moving. I took this opportunity to come and join this film to represent my people. A long time ago, our ancestors and elders once roamed this part of the country. And a lot of the things that you see here is how my ancestors once lived also. You can take one of these paddles <laughs> and work on shaping it. You have your hand on the inside, bracing against the inside of the pot. On the outside, you're using a paddle. This gives us not only texture, but also compresses the clay. And just like having like a credit card or a driver's license on a wet table in the summer, that it makes that stick. The fiber on this keeps this from sticking to the pot. Working within the village itself was very exciting. I think a lot of the native people enjoyed being in an environment that involved all these huge oaks, as well as these long houses that were you know, draped in mats and so forth. And especially within the, the great long house, uh, Powhatan's location. The interesting thing about this scene coming up is it is recorded from John Smith's memoirs and it's very, very, very specific. You know, stones being brought in, head laid down, clubs being lowered, is it to crush him? And, you know, absolute fear and the idea that he, he landed himself in hell. But it's a well-known, documented tradition of a medicine ceremony. Mulan will do a whole water ceremony on him, uh, an earth symbol on his head, and then uh, blow fire and use air just to do a thing. And then at that point, the animal dances. You guys would have got in and played, and the dances, the animal thing happens. What Terry and I talked about early on in you know, the beginning of our collaboration is that he would bring the European white man perspective of this history from their retelling, but we will simultaneously be telling a story reenacted through these ceremonies, through these dances, but from an Indian worldview. There's something about this story that just reading it and, and thinking about it, the meat of it, the emotion of it, the, the passion of it, the pain of it, and the history of it is very much about the Native Americans and to do today, which, which is a scene that I've been captured by a few of them and taken into their... Uh, Where are Macomaco? Yes. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, HQ, in other words. Indian HQ. And, you know, they're all... You can hear the greeting they're giving me there. That's my point of view. That's why I'm here talking to you, because that's my point of view. And it was fairly mad. They all did this. They've been rehearsing for weeks. Raul and his boys, the core lads, have been rehearsing for weeks doing these dances where they inhabit different characters, different animals, wolves, snakes. Raul, well, I think, was doing a chicken, and fuck me, man, they were in it. They were so in it. It was, it was fun, it's like having this snake and, and uh, you know, going into, you know, animal style. You know, I got to get wild, you know, have the uh, actual snake skin on me. You know, get to get wild, you know, kind of 
slid it through, you know, and it was good. And uh, it's tiring, but it was good. This right here, this is called uh, uh, Tiro, Tiro Hajo. My uh, great great grandfather's name was Crazy Snake, so I wear this in honor of him, Simino, Mido. <laughs> I have high hopes that, that, that this movie will be representative of a way of life that my forebears knew and enjoyed. I hope it will kind of telegraph to the world the, the kind of injustices that, that my people face. I hope it will further let the world know that we still exist today and, and that we are married to our culture and to our heritage and that we will uh, continue uh, to the end of time to let the world know who we, who we are. Realizing who you are and where you come from and where your, your people come from takes a big step, but even being thrown into a situation where you are, are dressed in a similar fashion and you're walking around a village that looks the same, you just can't help but getting thrown back and just realizing what a great life it was. And the, the guys that I was with, the, the core guys, just the way that they interacted, the songs that they sang, um, just really felt like there's a part of my life missing. You know, when I didn't, when they were singing, I didn't know the words. And it just made me really, really, really want to be a part of that even more. <laughs> face it that the ones like Jason are the future of our people and most of our history is oral and it's passed from generation to generation by stories and tales and Jason had a unique experience in that he actually got to be his ancestor and actually got to live his tradition so that it's, it's going to be more than just an oral tradition. He knows what his people looked like, he knows what his people wore, he knows how his people acted, and I think he will be able to pass this on to his children. Um, so in that sense, uh, the movie was an epiphany for him. It was truly rewarding, and, and I'm hopeful that he will continue on now with his professed interest in learning more and more about the Potomacs and the Powhatan people in general. There's a certain simpatico with what we're trying to shoot and capture in the film and the fact that everyone from the cast and crew above, below the line, all over the fucking place is on the set for 12 hours a day bar 30 minutes at lunch. Um, and everyone's tired, everyone's fatigued. All these folks were sick and dying. They didn't really know why. They thought it was a disease. It was a mixture of water and, you know, intestinal virus. So they were pretty dehydrated, feverish, and they died. <clears throat> thanks to the uh, natives and thanks to Pocahontas, they, a, few, a few survived. So we have a lot so stuck, stuck in the fucking well. Let him see you, man. Let him see you, man. Let him see you, man. Yeah. Medics. The water's going to water's gonna be a bit rotten for the first few weeks. Pack your leg off, please. Eat some coffee. Good night, chef. Get there. Oh, my God. Come on, Steve. Oh, when the crew gets out of the way and you see just the cast you looked into the fort here, you kind of have to pinch yourself and you go, wow, this is what it actually looked like. And these are the conditions these people came. What a ludicrous idea it was to come over here. Or what sort of, you know, I mean, what did you expect that this, for in 400 years, America is now what it is.
you know, that whole notion of discovery and taking risks to go into really the unknown. There aren't many places left where men go into the unknown. I mean, for themselves. You realize how these people really suffered and what they really went through. And as we get really lucky, we get to be the ones to tell their story. So it's, it feels like you're not just doing a movie, you're doing part of history. We get to see things, do things that probably only they did. I guess, like he was saying, it's just being able to see it almost through their eyes. In fact, there's been a few times it's almost been scary. We're sitting around, it's like we, we bumped, a lot of us just met and we basically stay together now. And it's like we've known each other in a prior lifetime almost. <laughs> it's, you know, if there's reincarnation, hey, we might be some of them. Can you feel it? Yeah, yeah, I must still be alive. Feel it? Oh, the blood. Oh. Make him pee in his trousers because he's scared when he's Make him pee in his trousers. Yeah, we're all wearing all these trousers because he's scared to kill himself. Then he kills himself. Listen, Joe, your dialect sessions weren't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it was that one word I couldn't get. Dead. He didn't have to do couldn't that. Couldn't say dead. <laughs> <laughs> Is it too late? We're all strangers at first. Now we're all a tight crew. We've all blended together. You know. And it's great camaraderie. You know. You come in. You come into work. You look forward to it. All right, guys. So here's our shot. I see. It. Camera handheld under the church, looking out towards the river. We'll have Noah and some colonists background. Everybody in the church. If you're in the church, standing around. Fall back to the back side of the church. Just give us some room up front here, please. Move yourselves back. Thank you. The great thing about filming on location is you're on location. When it rains, it's raining. And we'd film in the rain. We'd film in, in, in uh, blustery conditions, you know, conditions that weren't great for sound. We'd film in half light, you know, uh, overcast days, bright sun. And all that really just allows you to experience something. It adds an element. <laughs> It's vital to, to recreate uh, as similar conditions as you can, otherwise it is about artifice and makeup and, uh, you know, lighting effects and things like that. I mean, I love the fact that Terry doesn't use lights. You know, the mere fact that there aren't sort of cables and lights all around the place creates a very solid reality that, uh, you know, affects all the people working on it. The challenge of the fort was that the fort had to be in, built in many different phases because it, you know, when they first land, it needs to look like there's nothing, and then obviously we need to build it up, build it up, build it up. We're changing the fort over right now from between the, um, the battle scene and the starving time up to the more prosperous rebuilding when Newport comes back. So we've added two new houses and some extra structures, and we're going. We've updated some, like the church. Mostly it's just to show a progression of time and also um, the colonist ability and, and, and uh, kind of the wealth that's coming slowly, but uh, bit by bit try to make it show a, a passage of time. This is the brown mud that we use for the waddle and daub like you see on all the buildings. And during the fire, this is kind of what it looked like. But then when the heat of the fire turned it bright red, Looks like brick. We sent some of this to Jamestown, the APVA, because they're, they found pieces similar to this in their excavations, and they wanted to see how this compared to what they had. The way Terry likes to shoot and the spontaneity with which he likes to aim and frame the camera sort of excludes any opportunity to artificially light a scene. Um, it was more about keeping 
the, the lighting equipment out of the shot than to actually use it to light the shot. Jack, can I say something? Just that, do you see? Right there. Down that way? It took a while for Chivo to accept um, and to sort of change the, the way he looks at a scene. It was a process that both he and I had to get used to because he and I have done some very large lighting setups on various movies throughout the years. So where our solution to a lighting challenge would be to add light. Um, in this movie, it would be to find a direction where the light could be, the natural light could be used to light the scene instead. You just this see church is unbelievable. And you go, I, I thought it was coming down on me. I think the That's church the first time it's ever is a happened. challenge. I don't ever remember seeing the ring move. It'll probably be a you know I mean? finest work so ever. <laughs> They'll say, how did he do that? Okay, Lisa, start the smokers up again, please. Okay. Lisa, start the smokers. Okay. Make it was amazing for me to really see the changes <laughs> and go through the changes from just being in the in the forest, the carefree life, just listening to birds swimming in the river, just really, really happy. And being really confused and having having all these things happening around me and then going through all these different ups and downs and then finally on the end becoming at peace with everything after I've gone through all these things and I live a totally different life and have a son and a husband. Oh, she, she's she's looking camera down. left. Camera left. I just can't get my by the time Rolf came back, the fort only had five homes in it, and the rest of it was planted in tobacco. And they started taking land from the Indians, planted land from the Indians, and, and uh, burning their crops and putting in tobacco and burning their houses. And it's because of tobacco that the Indians were really moved out of Virginia. We wanted a different look for the John Rawls house since that was meant to, to show that the colony had moved outside the fort. So we moved to a beautiful location called the Berkeley Plantation and built this house complete as a house. It's full on 360 degree set, built it in three weeks. It was hard to build here at first because it was so muddy and then it dried up. And as soon as we finished, the rain came. It's a sloppy mess outside. This is the wettest year on record for Virginia. And we're here. And we're here, but it's great because otherwise it can just dry and you know, awful, dusty. And we've had very little dust and we've had uh, the grass to stay green longer. And the mud is so real, it's become like a, an element of the film. Our locations, for obvious reasons, were in remote areas along the river. And so to respect the integrity of the, the sets themselves, you know, the trucks weren't really nearby. So it was a matter of muling or, or vanning the equipment in. We want a place to get them away. And I just don't want them in here. Well, we don't have to hide them. I mean, it's just somewhere up there there's a place, where they can stand. There's a path. We can walk down the path, and it's a place where we're going to shoot later, but it's a, it's, a, okay. it's a little crop circle that they can okay. hang out at, and it's far away from the game. Or <laughs> okay, so I guess we're going to go that I'll away. Show you. Yeah, we can't cut across this here, so we have to go up and try to avoid plants. They're not going to walk on those planks, eh, Bubba? Will they walk on the planks? No. No. So we're just going to go up, cut where the planks are, and they, somewhere they they got to go the through planks, the corn. They'll get their, yeah, they they'll get their, their foot hung between them, and then what am I going to do? So, okay. so we'll just start walking this away, yeah? Well, then, they'll, then we'll have to go through the corn. Uh, 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 okay. I'm going to go scout. OK. Uh, this is Christopher Clark. Hello. Hang on. Here we go. Oh, we're going to go to Baker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Lucas? Oh, can we have, have we put the baby the other let's way around? Let's flip the baby yeah, you, you on, flip on your left shoulder. <laughs> 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 okay, Melissa, you can come right on in here to watch behind camera. We'll leave the passing in for a second. Yeah, until we're ready to go. Okay, here we go. Let's get it really, really quiet. I think we got that very <laughs> beautiful shot of the baby here. Is she okay? Or is she the, oh, no, she's good. She's fine. His vision seems to be a very romantic one of, uh, of the early beginnings of America and the discovery of the land. To him, it's a dream. And um, he sh I think that's a, a wonderful way of, of presenting it. It's one man's uh, uh, vision of it. Um, and he sees it, I think he sees it, uh, as a dream. Catherine's here and Janine is anxiously On my very first day, I was actually, you know, doing a scene. And then uh, my understanding was that they were shooting the other actor doing a close-up and I wasn't needed for it. And so I just went, I stayed on the set, but I was just sitting on the side and I was smoking the pipe that John Rolfe smokes. And, and then I suddenly realized that the camera was pointed at me. I'm always terrified that when he's got that camera on his shoulders, he's going to follow me into the toilet. He's got, I mean, he never stops. It's like some sort of great bird of prey on his shoulders that's driving him on. It's saying, no, no, don't ever put me down. You've got to get everything. <laughs> I don't know how the editors are going to watch all this material. They're coming this week. The editors? <laughs> For what? Tell you stop shooting too much. How much film are they shooting? A million feet or something, I believe. So is this it's a lot of film. Go Red Sox. And, uh, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, it is unusual, I guess. We've been on a few films. You have been on a film that's had as much film. Yeah, right? JFK. JFK, right? Yeah. But, uh, but this is... It, it really doesn't matter how much he's shooting. Now, after a while, after you're... After you're over half a million feet, That's you're tough. off to the races. It requires a lot of time and a lot of focus and concentration to go through all that footage and, you know, try to not lose perspective and uh, get the best pieces out. And it's always good to have many options and the more footage, the merrier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Especially <laughs> with three editors. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're excited. Yeah, it excited keeps us gainfully footage. employed. Exactly. Terry shoots a lot because I think he's trying to really get into the subconscious of the actors who inhabit these characters. Okay, keep running now. Pop and it he's up trying to camera. find, I think, these keep running, looking for more. kind of movements or postures, uh, expressions um, that the actors can give. Come here. Put him over in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> very funny at times because Terry liked Jack Fisk to create the houses and the, the, the locations so that he could shoot 360 degrees. So the crew had to be ready for that as well because unlike most movies where they absolutely know the camera's locked between these two positions, that's it. With Terry, you never knew. It could be there and then suddenly he's spinning around and looking there. So you can't have, you know, a bunch of, you know, the, uh, the gaffers and everybody at the craft service set up right there. But, uh, and, and I couldn't stop laughing on my very first day when, uh, when, he, when he did do this thing to me where he just suddenly turned the camera on me and said, Christian, do whatever you feel like doing. You know, walk up and down, do whatever, do whatever you want to do. And so I did start doing that. And I realized that, okay, there was a bunch of crew over there. So if I walked over there, what were they going to do? <laughs> so I... My bloody-minded nature, I was like, I'm going to go take a look, see what they do. So I did. I'd start walking over there, and they were running. <laughs> they were diving behind bushes to get out of the way, you know, because they just knew this was part of the deal of working with Terry. They could spin around any second. I'm used to a director, uh, Simon Winsor, or Beresford, whatever, will come with a storyboard in the morning. This is what we're going to do today. This will this will be a dolly shot. Then if we have time, we'll get to another scene, blah, blah, blah. Well, I guess that this is, this is Malik's uh, genius, if you like, that... Uh, he sees it as he works. And that's the feeling I'm getting from it anyway, that he's not sure how he's gonna shoot a scene. 
you'll say to the camera, you say, well, let's, let's try this. And then he'll get behind the camera and then he'll, that's where his genius comes in, I guess. And it's, it's, it's magic time. Oh my goodness! Look at this! Best shot in the movie. Right here. Best shot in the movie. Go a little closer to the lamp, Korean pizza. Oh, sorry. Perry, I'm not joking. Can somebody this push could my be the best shot of the movie. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Look at these. Again. Quail. No, I'm not Oh my goodness! Oh yeah! We're gonna do some killing today! <laughs> As the battle grew closer, we then had a couple of weekend rehearsals where Andy would work with the with the extras and the core guys to choreograph and finesse uh, the battle scene. You have to be professional, no laughing, no matter what. You drop your weapon, you break your weapon, you make a mistake, you hit your fan, whatever. No laughing. Keep going. If you feel tired, lie down on the ground, you die. Okay, that's all you did. You, you don't need to create something or something like funny or don't laughing because there's so many people involved, they have explosion, they have camera rolling and no one want to stop. You, you know, you wound the fame, you just, if you feel something, you can't control yourself anymore, you just lie down on the ground. I got one time, no second time. Okay, you always ready, okay? No laughing. Will be long. Listen, I remember I say, it will be long shot. They won't cut. It won't cut. If you tire, like I say, you can face off. Remember, you can, you can with your partner, you both tie, you can face off like this. That, I buy it, but not laughing. Andy had several meetings with Jack and Terry to kind of get the feel and uh, Terry's vision for the, for the battle itself. From that, Andy went back and worked with some storyboards to kind of present it to Terry so that, um, so that Terry and Andy were kind of on the same wavelength regarding what Terry wanted uh, for the battle. And so then when we got there, it was really basically just a matter of, you know, which way are we looking first, what we want to do first. And we basically started big, and the first couple of days, it was Terry and Andy, all of us working together to get the big scenes. The rehearsals we did um, were basically uh, like fighting techniques. Had four different groups, and each group had uh, different stages uh, that they had to follow, uh, format they had to follow. Uh, my group, I was number two. Number two is uh, where um, we uh, wrestle to the ground. We do a couple swings, wrestle to the ground, get back up, do swings, wrestle to the ground. And then uh, somebody takes a fall, which means I either uh, kill him, take his own sword, stab him, and come out victorious. And uh, it's very, uh, very, pretty complex. It looks really complex when you go fast. Uh, we try to keep our pace really fast, so it looks uh, tighter. It looks more, uh, a lot of movement, more active. Uh, and that's one thing I noticed with all the all the groups together. You know, is, is whenever it was quick and fast, and everybody was going like that, it looked it looked you know real. And that's what we try to do: get as real as real as we can. And that's getting close as we can to hitting them, but not. Wait, pass the camera. Go, go, go. All right, sorry. Go, go. Just do manage. Okay, but that's okay. Keep going. Speed, go in. Keep one into it. Stand man, go. Back up. You keep back up. Keep going forward. Okay, do it again. Go, go, down, go, go. Fuck out of the way. Forward, go. Check back. We go check back. Go. Step back. We check back. Step back. We check back. Yeah, end up here. Right. When he go here, fight, 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 until He's this guy kind of rehearsal. He stuck with saw in some here. We trap back with him. Go, 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 go. You kill this guy, and this guy will want him in front of your camera. So when the, one of the last moves, like him to me, yeah. I grab him here. Go like this. I, I lead him back towards you. Yeah, yeah but you should keep him. Yeah, but this Show moment you should keep him in the room because the two guy would come. The two guys are coming in straight off the back of that. So when I have him and I start pushing you, Jimmy, when I start pushing you back that way. Yeah, and then you start going. Go even more than I'm actually pushing you. You know, take give yourself a couple of yards. Yeah. Back round. Back round.
You just walk out of the fort and you feel like you're there. It's very intense, especially the scene we're shooting now, the battle scenes. Everybody's pretty uh, keyed up and uh, safety is always an issue, but uh, everybody seems to be uh, looking out for each other. But it's, it's intense. It's very intense. You know, this guy's up in the towers and they're, you know, packing their guns, packing their rifles and shooting them off and packing them again and putting them there and packing them and shooting them. And cannons are going off and the Indians are fucking screaming and yelping and scalping and, and, and the uh, colonists are, are trying to fight back. And there's just blood and a few bits and pieces of guts and, and uh, it's messy. It's messy as it should be. The battle's going great, everything's gone well, no one's been hurt, and the guns are going off. So, considering the weather, the weapons are firing magnificently. Normally these things will not fire in the rain at all. We've been firing with it raining solid and pouring down. We've been making our shots. Let's clear. When the smoke is good, we're going. She's lighting up. We'll cut lighten up. Cut the smoke. Cut the smoke. Kill the smoke. Cut the smoke. Let's we burn the fort. Don't tell Jack. Right Let's now? burn it. Let's go. Come on, Billy. Let's go. Come on. Back here. Back here. Back here. Back here. Yo, Pablo. The wrong way is that you didn't run like that the first week, you fuckers. Here we go. Here we go. I got a, I got a gun over here. Ready? Okay. Here we go. Run and fire. Here we go. In a way, those those original keepers of the land should have been the people that they they listened to and learnt from. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened if the Europeans had adapted to a kind of look around, guys, look around. A combination of the two cultures rather than trying to dominate the other and, and impose impose religious beliefs and things like that. And because, you know, 200, 300, 400 years later, these, these problems still... Uh, there are still manifestations of these problems existing today. This experience has definitely changed me a little bit and Pocahontas has qualities like uh, courageousness and uh, love and a love for life and every little thing so and so that will always be part of me. This is a gale. Hurricanes do seem to follow us wherever we go. We hit five of them in Virginia, and we hit one of them here in England, and it was the first one that they've had in 24 years. All the neighbors out here just watching the water is so dramatic. Even though we've gotten so much rain and hurricanes, in an odd way it's provided beautiful light because what happens after a hurricane is beautiful skies. Okay, roll it! Tractors from 9 to 10. Okay.
Is the death of John Smith. The death of John Smith. Yes, darling. I'm just giving us a quick. Would you like some help? Don't no, no, mind no, no. just a bit of a hand. Hey, if you hey, could be babe. preparing no. some. I'm, I'm using acetone because the sulfur is not prepared. Yeah. yeah. I had a blast. Sorry, it wasn't the easiest time, but it shouldn't. It doesn't have to be easy. It's not about it's easy. It's mm -hmm. about enjoying it and I enjoyed it, but it wasn't yeah. necessarily the easiest. Am I hairy? Um, <laughs> but it was great, yeah. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Loved it. John Smith. Yeah. Yeah. 